Greg, long time. How are your parents doing? Good, that's a strange first question after not seeing you for five years. Sorry, lately I have been looking into how parenting and culture have an impact on child development. I seem to ask everyone how their household situation is or was. Do you know anything about this topic? Yes, a little bit, but can you enlighten me? I would be glad to. As you know, parenting and culture have a direct impact on a child's behavioral development. More specifically, parenting and culture her cultural heritage influence personal, social, and moral development. In other words, there are important forces within the environment in which a child develops their behavior, social skills, and sets of values? Exactly! So can you explain to me in what specific ways parenting has an impact on child development? Absolutely! I have been researching several different scholarly opinions on this matter, such as Lauren Steinberg and Diana Bomren, and have come to the conclusion that five different parenting strategies exist. Authoritative parenting, controlling parenting, laissez-faire parenting, harsh disciplinary parenting, and abusive parenting. I can already see the type of parenting that I experienced from this list. Let's make sure of that by looking a little more closely to some characteristics of each one. Within authoritative parenting, parents provide love and support, but also have high expectations and standards of performance. This creates happy, energetic, confident, likable, sociable, self-control, and empathetic children. With controlling parenting, parents try to control every action of their child. This creates an unhappy, anxious child with low social skills. Laissez-faire parenting entails very permissive parents. Often, the result is that children will become selfish, unmotivated, impulsive, and lack motivation. Harsh disciplinary parenting entails parents who are very authoritarian in nature. Children become defiant, explosive, and unpredictable. Finally, abusive parenting involves parenting through physical, psychological, and emotional abuse, which results in the development of low self-esteem, emotional difficulties, and aggressiveness by children. Of course, keep in mind that natural child temperament can affect parenting styles. My parents were definitely authoritative in their parenting techniques. That must explain why you're such a well-rounded individual. <laughs> <laughs> How does all this have an effect on our profession as teachers? I assume that you're still a teacher, right? Yes, I am. Some scholars have suggested that teachers should act as resource persons for parents who are in need to establish good parenting strategies. What I found most interesting in my research is that the majority of scholars advocate parent-teacher collaboration as a whole. Greater involvement in children's school life, a stronger communication on the part of the teacher in informing parents on their child's social and academic progress. Most of these conclusions have been done through small-scale studies, but all seem to point towards the same conclusion throughout North America. That all sounds great, Greg, for primary school, but what about for our teaching in secondary? Well, I have come to realize that these conclusions still apply to students in early secondary years, but less to students in later years. I doubt that parents will take advice from teachers on parenting their 16, 17-year-old boy or girl. But even for this, I have found that I have been able to identify parenting strategies by looking at the behavior of some of my secondary students. I have had cases of unstable and explosive students who definitely had harsh disciplinary parents and potentially abusive ones. Consequently, I tried to empathize with their situation and develop strategies to deal with this behavior knowing the circumstances. Greg, thanks for all the info. Would you like me to move on to the culture and behavior now? Well, to be honest, I've already done some research in the past regarding this. How about I try to summarize my conclusion on this subject and see what you think? Ça serait incroyable! My research has shown that parenting and culture are highly connected. First off, as you must know, you've been traveling the world. 
Different culture groups encourage different social behavior. C'est vrai. I have noticed, for instance, that during my time in teaching in Turkey, children were taught not to contest authority or that of their superiors. This, I have found, is the opposite here in Canada, where we encourage students to challenge the views of elders within a logical framework. That is a perfect example. Parents teach children to fit within their cultural groups by learning cultural norms, what is and what is not acceptable, as well as the roles of people within the society. This is called socialization. This is often strengthened at school so that the child can fit within the society in which they live. Remember the video we watched in Boyd's class some years back about Mr. Kanamori's fourth grade class? Oh oui! That was nice, although a little stage, I thought. Still, this is a perfect example of what I was explaining. Okay, but what about children who immigrate? They must face a different reality. Yes, and we deal with those children on an everyday basis as teachers in multicultural school settings. With immigration, home rules and school rules often conflict. This conflict emerges from the clash of values between the host and home country. Going back to your Turkey example, a Turkish child who recently immigrated to Quebec will be introduced to the concept of questioning authority, which is a no-no at home. This has a direct impact on the behavioral development of that child. Makes sense, but how do we as teachers solve this issue? It's not that easy, but it basically revolves around the same conclusions that you had for parenting. Parent-teacher cooperation. Most scholars I researched recommended clear communication between the teacher and the parents so that the parents feel involved in their students' learning and acquire an understanding of the values in their home country. Carmen Urdinigra English, in a small case study of a specific number of classes in the U.S., has even gone further by proposing that some in-class teaching content and values should be made relevant to the student's home country. This may be easier to do in a country or school where a majority of the immigrants are from a specific demographic region, but much harder in the schools I teach where immigrants come from everywhere. I guess sometimes small case studies have their limitations. Yes, you're right, and I'm in a similar situation. All this to say that although parent-teacher relations are important in this context, we must always clearly demonstrate that we are there for students who are caught in this value turmoil to which they must adapt independently. Thanks for all of this detailed info, Ariel. It really sounds like what I have researched so far. Why don't we try to represent what we've summarized through examples? That sounds terrific! Bringing this theory into the classroom, we as teachers should mimic the role that authoritative parents provide for their children. This means that as teachers, we must provide emotional warmth, maintain high expectations, and standards for behavior consistently enforce rules and explain the reasoning behind those rules. Does that make sense to you, Greg? It sure does, Ariel. We've all faced unruly classrooms at times. I know I have. During one of my substitutions, I faced an unruly classroom. The students did not know what to expect from me. I made a big mistake by being too permissive, and I did not stick to my own rules. The students were able to manipulate me into letting them read in groups, which of course became a disaster. They were unaware of the rules of my classroom because I was a sub and I didn't maintain high expectations. Wow, that really sounds like it got out of hand. What have you done since then to remedy this? Yeah, Greg, it did get away from me that day. Since then, I've implemented stricter guidelines in my classroom without being overly controlling, which as we know, can make students defiant and unpredictable. I've worked with my students in a democratic way to create our own agreed upon set of rules. We worked as a group to explain why some behaviors are acceptable and others are not. Further, I maintain high expectations for behavior in all of my classrooms, and my students help me with this. I use a time management method where I look at my watch whenever the students are wasting my time. They actually ask each other to be quiet rather than relying on me to do this, and this gives my students a chance to become more responsible learners. Lastly, I always provide a lot of feedback and support for my students something I had not realized was as important as it is for teachers to develop students' self-esteem. So what do you think, Greg? All your techniques are inspirational, Aria. I sure will be using all of this when I substitute next time. Oh, there's my bus. Catch you in five more years.